Hello and welcome. I am joined by Noshi Kaka, Managing Director of McKinsey in India. Noshi, thank you very much for speaking with us. Uh, you know, you've put together some very interesting facts and figures, looking back at history and then also projecting into the future. One of the things you're saying in the context of the IT services industry uh, and perhaps driven by digitization is that 25% of jobs will just go away or the jobs as we know them. Uh, and this is by 2025. And this has already begun to happen as companies are becoming more focused on productivity and lowering headcount. So how did you arrive at this conclusion and how bad is it? So I think, Govind, this is actually not just for the IT industry, but what we did is we looked globally uh, at you know all forms of technology and all disruptive technologies, and we looked at it at, at, and we looked at three classes of workers. We looked at the industrial you know workers, we looked at service industries, and we took a cat cut of service industries and said knowledge workers. And what you find actually is the knowledge workers are most susceptible mm. to the threat of automation and digitization, mm. and we think something like 25 to 30 percent by 2025 of the total knowledge worker pool globally mm. can actually be automated or disrupted in some ways. And, and this is 10 years, and these are obviously people who are in the workforce today. Absolutely. It's not so far in the future. Absolutely. And why is it, I mean, so, and I guess the disturbing part is it's knowledge workers who you thought were always protected yes. in some ways. Yes. Why is that? I think it's very simple. I mean, if you look at the knowledge workers, and if you look at improvements in actual, actually where technology is going with sensors, with compute power, with cloud, uh, and with neural networks, and, and uh, uh, programming such as was on my panel today with, uh, with Chetan Dubey, what you're actually seeing is that the ability of machine learning and computer k neural capability is rapidly approaching what we humans mm -hmm. historically have enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And so what you are starting to see is in parts of our work which are repetitive, mm -hmm. uh, which are typically aligned with a desk, that's where you're starting to see these kind of impact go much further. And it's not that this industry is not cognizant of that. If you look at uh, even the last two years of this industry has seen a dramatic division between the revenues added and the people, net people employed. Mm -hmm. right? So you already start seeing that that is actually starting to play out. Right. So the other thing you talked about is in keeping with the sort of going digital or future uh, digital f uh, framework is that technology is becoming a very large component of overall capital spend. Yeah. And this could come as a surprise to someone who's not been following yeah. this. No, it's actually, it was uh, frankly a surprise when we looked at the numbers to ourselves as well, um, is that, you know, 40% of total capital spent in the U.S. today is spent on technology. 40% is a staggering number. I mean, if you think about everything that capital, bridges, boats, roads, everything, uh, and you look at that and you say 40% of spend is actually technology. When you peel it back and you look at a car, you look at a house, you look at you know, everything, I mean, you can see that technology is becoming just increasingly centric. Mm. And so we're seeing two or three effects of that. One is if it is truly 40%, of course it's not there in the emerging economies, right. but in developed economies, then the cost of technology or the return on technology is gonna more and more equate or influence the return on capital. Right? And that's a huge shift because many companies have not figured out how to get the best return on technology. The second implication for us is that technology is becoming a balance sheet item. Right. What I mean by that is you historically have looked at technology to improve the utilization of people or the revenue side or typically a P&L item. Right? Now you're finding it's becoming significant on the balance sheet. And if I can use technology to reduce the capital cost or improve productivity of my capital, mm. that opens up a whole new area. Mm. And so we are starting to see many, many shifts like this that we historically have never seen before. Right, so and if I were to now ask you to look ahead and say, uh, what are the three things that people should be most concerned about? And if you could illustrate that, maybe that'll help as well. Sure. And how could, I mean, if, if they are late in the race or late in the game, is there, a, how could they use this as an opportunity if so? You know, traditionally, if you look at our industry, we've grown in the last 15 years extraordinarily well, and we've done some phenomenal things. But one of the things that we've concentrated our spend on is we've spent a lot on the traditional areas mm -hmm. of IT, the annuity spends, mm -hmm. right, which has historically been our most profitable. It has also been the basis on which we've learned and trained our people. Mm -hmm. One of the big shifts we're seeing is that the traditional, what we call legacy spending, is probably going to go down by anywhere between 15 to 25 percent. Yeah. Now at some level you say that that's okay because it still means that 75% or more will be legacy. But when you see a decline of that nature in a segment which is dominated by, by our industry, it actually will have a disproportionate impact on our industry. 
At the same time, you see huge opportunities emerging on the so-called digital new age technology, including cybersecurity, including IoT, and the smack stack. So essentially what you're seeing is that a new business almost is being built on the side. Mm -hmm. right? And that business doesn't respond to our traditional metrics of cost and productivity. It responds to speed, it responds to customer experience, mm. it responds to time to market, and you almost need a different people, a different economic model to sustain that. So I think one of the big challenges focusing on this industry is how do you, in this two-speed, three-speed IT world, how do you manage a two-speed, three-speed organization? So what's a good example of an organization who's doing that or trying to do it? So I think even if you look at some of the traditional top-tier organizations from India, you'll see actually they've, they have actually crafted their business into what they call Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3 businesses. Mm -hmm. Horizon 1 is your annuity spend, which you have to manage and continuously eke out cost and performance. You see Horizon 2 businesses uh, where you have invested capital to be able to transform that business or a service line. Building a digital bank mm -hmm. is an example of mm -hmm. that. And third, you saw some of my panelists today talk about it, where they have actually got funds to invest in startups, right? Yeah. So you're now managing Before three, one example, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're essentially seeing mm. a company which was essentially a single business model, a single people model, a single financial model, going into three companies. Mm. And that's a huge change. Right, well, what's your sense? I mean, you know, so we've all looked at the stretch targets for Indian IT. Uh, are, are you, do you get a sense that given the way the world has changed, it will change even faster than ever before? Indian IT will be able to keep up and meet the same number targets as before? You know, we have a huge platform and a huge base, mm. but we are also the incumbents, mm. right? And that produces both the challenge and the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about the attacker companies, yeah. yeah. And we see, you know, it, it is true that today, um, you know, when we talk to CIOs and CXOs, mm they see about 40% of that new spend not coming to the traditional mm -hmm. service providers mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have a huge platform to build from because mm -hmm. if you look at a company, at your end client, mm -hmm. they are operating across these three mm -hmm. horizons as well. Mm -hmm. And if you really understand the complexity of their current environment and are able to take costs out of that and reinvest it in growth and build mm -hmm. that capability in an effective way, you can be a very powerful competitor, mm -hmm. right? Whether you will change fast enough, mm -hmm. That is the eternal question. Right, but attackers are increasingly taking away large chunks of incremental growth is what you've argued as well. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, the last question, are uh, Indian companies uh, fundamentally geared to think like this? I mean, you know, can you, can you become an attacker overnight? I think you are seeing that, uh, you know, what I have tremendous faith in is that this industry traditionally responds very well to what clients lead them, push them, drive them, right? I think you're equally seeing them becoming, you know, really self-starting and thinking on their own as well. So I think led by clients or pushed by circumstance and their own insight or intuitiveness, I think they will move. They will move faster than what we've seen. And by the way, they already are right. moving. If you remember for years, we talked about non-linear not being a reality. Mm. Well, today, uh, if I look at the last year, the addition of revenue headcount versus the uh, revenue versus headcount is now at 0.5 of what it was four years ago, mm. right? So if you look at that and you see those trends playing out, then you have tremendous faith in this industry. And that's a good note to end on. Thank you, Noshir. Thank you.